Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you for choosing to spend a little time with us during our Sunday morning worship experience. And I pray that you will be blessed uh, by something that you receive in this message. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our prayer is that you will show us the importance of recognizing the problems that we face with our belief as we sometimes misinterpret what you give us to believe. Create within us clean hearts and renew a right spirit in us so that we can be steadfast and maturing in our holiness for Jesus' return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A uh, week before last, our focus was on our calling, a call to holiness. Last week, our focus was on our conduct, a conduct of holiness. Now this week, our focus is on our problem, the problem of holiness. Our text is found in uh, Romans chapter four, chapter 10, I'm sorry, uh, verse four. Romans chapter 10, verse four, it reads, for Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. We've been looking at the fact that we must die to the law. The law brought uh, much worry, and it was difficult to function without worrying when there was the law. And the law was what we had, or all that we had to depend on. It required that our character be good when the function of the law was and is designed to make mankind aware of our shortcoming, of our needs. Our disobedience to the law brought death along with separation from God. And we were reminded by the Apostle Paul that it's impossible for us to fulfill the requirement of the law, that we must die to the law. And Paul also reminded us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must cease to depend on keeping the law as a possible way for us to meet the requirements of our creator. Just as God provided a sacrifice to Abraham, who was requested to take his son, Isaac, to offer him as an atonement for sins. Isaac was the first type of a living sacrifice because God provided him a ram uh, or provided himself a ram as uh, a sacrifice. And Isaac was allowed to go back home with Abraham, therefore uh, uh, a living sacrifice. He was uh, taken and to be offered as a sacrifice, but God fixed it so that he could go home alive. God provided his son, Jesus, as a living sacrifice that gives uh, or gave his life to atone for the sins of the world. Now, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, since we have died to the law and our dependence is upon Jesus. And therefore, uh, we're depending on Jesus instead of the law to justify us before God. Now, our problem is one that's termed uh, antinomian or antinomianism. It's a point of view overly intrigued by the truth that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. What results is more interest in freedom to live as one chooses than to cultivate a life of holiness. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, antinomianism uh, instills or, or brings about the problem of thinking that since we are saved by grace, then it's okay for us to live any way we want to. What a problem. Uh, Paul rebukes such a tendency with the observation that the believers, as God sees it, has died with Christ to sin. He has no further obligation to serve the law. It's important, therefore, to think that one should or we should uh, continue to live in sin. That, that, that's not the correct way of thinking. If you think that, 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 that uh, what Jesus did uh, 
okays us to continue in sin, then we've got a problem. At the summary of today's sermon, I'll try to share with you a few verses from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, hopefully. Now, again, antinomianism uh, concerns the view that Christians are released for, by, by grace from the obligation of serving the moral law. Uh, even though Paul says that Christ is the end of the law, what he's saying is Christ is the end of our obligation to try to fulfill the law. Because Jesus fulfilled the law by paying the price for our sins and therefore setting us in a right relationship with God. Now, this idea is uh, easily to be disapproved and few would openly subscribe to it. Nevertheless, it remains a problem to believers who are content to come to terms with their sin in their own lives and remain unwilling to seek a way of deliverance. The second problem and the opposite tendency is perfectionism. The position that it is possible for a believer to make diligent use of the means of grace and to be so fulfilled, fully committed to the will of God that sin is successfully eliminated. Perfectionism uh, hinges on the idea that that we take advantage of grace, but we are com but 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 we're committed to the idea of thinking and living like we are doing. Uh, uh, we're we're living so distant from sin on our own that we have a part, an important part that we can play. That allows us to take credit for part of our salvation. And that's totally contradictory to we are saved by grace through faith. Now, it should be granted that the desire to attain such a state is praiseworthy. But consequently, perfectionism can be set aside only for the best reason. When we find that Paul, who uh, is appealed to for support of the perfectionist position because of his teachings in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. And part of that uh, is that says, since we have this prom these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in fear of God. Now, Paul actually denies perfectionism in his own life. He says that he stra he's straining towards the goal in, in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. He says, not that I have already uh, obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. And then verse 13 says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies ahead or what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So Paul is not stating that he has made it to perfection. But he continues to to work towards and not to fulfill, be perfect, but to live as he has been called. We are called to holiness. Our conduct shows holiness and we are working towards becoming more and more like Jesus, which renders us more and more holy like Jesus. And, and, and we always have to do that with the mindset that no matter how hard we work, no matter what we do, that we will not reach perfection until Jesus returns. 
and changes us from what we are to what we shall be. Until Jesus changes us from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortality. And when Jesus returns, we'll see him as he is and we will be like him. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse nine says, but we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that uh, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Now we begin to sense that the whole subject needs careful examination and clarification because we have a we, we can have a problem with the idea that Christ is the end of the law uh, when in actuality he fulfilled to end it. And it does not give us a law to live any kind of way. The word perfect must be given its full weight when used of God. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 48, we can, we can have a little bit more clarity on that. God is our ultimate standard of holiness, and we should not desire a lesser one. But the word perfect itself, in its general man word, not God word use, means fully grown or mature, and that its meaning in the teachings go along with sanctification. Paul says, I'm straining towards the goal. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, the English Standard Version, he says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, in essence. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind the law and straining towards what lies ahead, more of grace and God's holiness. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, he presents as the goal of Christian of the Christian ministry as a perfect or a mature man. He's not thinking in individual terms even, but collectively. He says, we all. So he does not have in mind the hope that a few individuals may arrive at sinless perfection. A very good statement to our problem because too often we think that we are holier than others. When we are holy only because of what Jesus has done for us and not anything that we have done. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, until we all obtain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Paul's desire is that his readers, all of them, may be no longer babies so that the perfection in view is a spiritual maturity. Furthermore, the picture of Christian of the Christian life presented in scripture is one of constant hostility and conflict between the flesh and the spirit. Galatians uh, chapter 5 verse 17 uh, says, for the desire of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. There's no reason to think that this situation relates only to some believers or that it will be altered during one's earthly pilgrimage. The victory of which Paul uh, writes in the book of Romans is not the complete eviction of of sin, but the breaking of its dominion in the life of Christians. Uh, we no longer need to be slaves to sin's control. 
we can have deliverance by counting on the fact that we have died with Christ to sin by presenting him and uh, his renewed power of the body and the spirit of God for his holiness. Finally, the scripture leads us to expect perfection for the whole person in the mature uh, and future when Christ comes again, as found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And after we have come to Christ for salvation, our minds are still limited. Only when we see him face to face will we know uh, him as he is. And then we will know ourselves and be as he is. Our bodies are still subject to invasions of illnesses and dilapidation. Each day we grow older and older, weaker and weaker, and we wear out more and more. These things signal the prospect of death. Maturity should be our goal for the present life, and perfection belongs to the day of Christ when we will be fully transformed into his likeness. But meanwhile, only one has been able to act without fear. Which of you convict me of sin? As found in John chapter 8, verse 46. Even though one may feel that he has or she has not sinned for a considerable period of time, it is hazardous and dangerous to make that feeling our norm. And furthermore, holiness is not simply the absence of sin, but being filled with the spirit and reflecting the love of Christ. Can anyone say in good faith that he or she has done this consistently? Holiness has a threefold aspect. All believers are positioned are positionally holy by virtue of our calling as saints. We are then called to such conduct as benefit our position in Christ. And we are to seek by God's help to grow and mature with the life of Christ as our pattern for true righteousness. Without this holiness, which confirms the salvation experience, no one will see the Lord, as stated in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. The final phase of holiness will be reached when Christ completely or completes the process of salvation by his return, when all of his own will be like him, seeing him as he is the perfect and glorious son of God, as stated in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Now, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to read uh, Romans chapter 6, the first, uh, first, first few verses of that, where Paul summarizes, I think, this sermon. Uh, he talks about dead to sin and alive to God. Verse 1 reads, what shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death and we are buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul continues by saying in verse 5, for if we have been united with him in death, a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a re resurrection like his. And we know that our old self was crucified with him 
in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer live and be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. And now if, if we have died with Christ, we live uh, or we believe that we will also live with him. Verse nine says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So that uh, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now let us not sin, therefore, let not sin therefore reign in our mortal bodies to make us obey its passion. Do not uh, represent your members as sin or to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. And verse 14 says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are no longer under the law, but under the, under grace. Those verses simply are saying that Jesus died one Friday after they had buried him in a borrowed tomb. And then three days later, after he was crucified for our sins, God raised him from the dead with all power in his hands. And now we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. That's not too much for God to ask of us. And the best way to do that is not being conformed to the world, but by being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's all I've got for this week. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, work in us to continually accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Help us to always depend on him instead of the law for a right relationship with you, our Creator. Strengthen our faith and resilience to recognize when we that when we're right and when we're wrong. Make us uh, to walk in the way that is plain and make your way uh, so that we will understand your words and your deeds correctly and not misinterpret them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us and we pray that God will bless your time uh, spent listening to this YouTube message and that uh, Christ being the end of the law will not create a problem, but it will become and be the solution for all of us that will put our trust in him. Uh, until next time, wear your mask, uh, practice social distancing, wash your hands often, and vote, vote vote. My wife and I, we voted uh, this past Wednesday, I believe, whenever the first of whenever the 14th was, we voted. And uh, now we're encouraging everybody that we can to vote. So vote between now and November 13. So long, uh, November 3rd, I'm sorry. So long. <laughs>